Hello, and welcome to A Glastonbury Romance. Today we begin Chapter 4. Hick Jasse. That's spelled H-I-C-J-A-C-E-T. Don't, don't know how to pronounce it. I'm not a pronouncer. Don't know what it means. Maybe we'll find out. The Reverend Matt Decker, vicar of Glastonbury, was working in his garden. He was loosening the earth around his long, straight rows of potatoes, while his son Sam was going backward and forward with an old wheelbarrow to a smoldering rubbish heap under the high wall above which he deposited the weeds which his father pulled up. Matt Decker was a man of sixty, a widower from his only child's birth twenty-five years ago. His powerfully banked-up affections had been concentrated themselves upon two objects, upon Christ, the Redeemer of his soul, and upon Sam, the son of his loins. It was about ten months this March since he had lad, his lad had taken his degree at Cambridge, and the first serious misunderstanding between father and son was even now, month by month, gathering weight and momentum. It had to do with the young man's profession and with the young man's first love affair. Having brought him up with the constant idea of his taking orders, having seen him graduate with a credible third class in the divinity tripos, it is not difficult to imagine the crushing blow that fell upon the luckless father when, the question arising as to what particular theological college he was now to enter, the lad gravely and resolutely declined to carry the thing a step further. And at that point the matter had hung fire for more than a half a year. Refusing to give up hope of a change of heart in his son, Matt Decker had followed the policy of complete inertness. Every opening in life, except unskilled manual labor, requiring the expenditure of some initial sum, the older man, without consciously tyrannizing, acted on the assumption that economic pressure, negatively exercised, was the best weapon that age possessed in dealing with the wolfiness of youth. Apart from religion, their tastes were unusually congenial. They both loved gardening, they both loved natural history, they both were proud and shy and antisocial. In their secluded rectory, surrounded by walls 15 feet high and faced even across the road by nothing more gregarious than the equally high wall of the abbey house, they were able to follow their hobbies at, as botanists, etymologists, geologists, ichthyologists without cessation or interruption. Mrs. Ducker had been a French Swiss from the city of Geneva. She had indeed been the pretty housemaid in this very house when Mr. Decker took it over, and the girl with it when he entered upon his labors in Glastonbury as a young bachelor priest some thirty years ago. But she had died in childbirth, and since that day there had been no more pretty housemaid. Indeed, it might be said that there had been no more women of any kind within the rectory walls. For Penny Pitches, their one servant, could only be regarded as a woman under that what Sir Thomas Brown would have called, in speaking of other difficulty, difficult questions, a wide solution. Penny Pitches had lost her own baby just about the time of Sam's birth, and since that day she had been as good as a mother to Sam. She had suckled him, taught him his letters, taught him his manners, for she was not only to spare the rod, taught his morality, his mother wit, his legends, and his superstitions. But with these female attributes, Penny Pitch's appearances was more gnome-like than anything else. She was undoubtedly the least human-looking anthropoid mammal in the whole county of Somerset. Penny Pitch's was not deformed. She was no humpback. What nature had done was to make her back so broad and her legs so short that she presented the appearance of a playing card queen of spades, a queen of spades endowed with the privilege, privilege of three dimensions and the power of locomotion, but denied the natural separation of head from shoulders and a bust from hips, which was a usual inheritance of female mortality. She was, in fact, an animated Euclidean square moving about over the earth. Nature had, however, in order to compensate Penny for these peculiarities, given her a volubility of speech that was womanly and more than womanly. To speak the truth, the tongues of a dozen cantankerous shrews and a dozen lacutious trollops resided in this gnome-like skull. It was Penny herself who now appeared upon the scene, and standing between wheelbarrow and potato row, 
delivered herself a review of that morning's general outlook. It is not that I quarrel with thee for going out to lunch, as they called it. That's any it to please itself about. What I do and always shall uphold is that for a person not to know in vast whether there's to be dinner on table or no dinner on table is a mock to reason. Try my accents out here. Who told you that we were going out today, Penny? protested Mr. Decker mildly, leaning upon his fork. He was in his shirt sleeves, and his large, rugged cheeks were redder than usual, against the clipped gray whiskers that surrounded them. His chin and his upper lip were clean-shaven, and, as if to make up for this, his eyebrows above his formidable gray eyes were so long that they resembled the pair of thatched eaves. "'Wold man, weatherwax," replied the vicarage servant. He ran to me pantry with saucy tales about to turn milk in a pan. He do say that Miss Mary over the way had a cousin come to town would be lodging with Mr. Evans, and now Antiquity's man, who's looking over old Jones's shop, who's to hospital again with one of these little cystus and do trouble he. I said to our surprise to unsilly soul world sonner it is, that Miss Drew allowed us such doings. But I said to he, I said, if Mrs. Drew thinks Enough of Miss Mary Cousin to ask us to meet him. Though I be a friend of that new antiquity man, I must be one of that grave factory people. Crow ain't no common name. Crow ain't no West County name, Crow ain't. And our Miss Mary, as us do know, be related to their rich folk. So I do be come straight to air, master, to reason with here as to why, when he's been good out for dinner, we haven't let us so much as to hear a word of it. Woof, I hope we don't have too much of her. I was just this very minute coming to tell you of our invitation, Penny, murmured the clergyman. It hadn't arrived at breakfast. In fact, Weatherwax might, might have brought it. I suppose there's no excuse for us, eh, Sam? And he glanced humorously from above the rim of his spectacles and from beneath his bushy eyebrows at the lad on the further side of the wheelbarrow. Young Sam Decker answered the look with a grin. Then he suddenly got red. You've not forgotten, father, he said, that you promised to have tea at Woodcake Lake Cottage with the Zoilands. Before Mr. Decker could reply to this, Penny Pitches turned angrily on the lad. And you're dragging the master over the girl marshes, are you too, then? It's that little white scut of a Miss Zoiland you after, Miss Sam Decker. And don't you forget that I told ye of it. Oh, I do know it. I do know, as yes, Sammy and blessed babe, tis a daffodownly day like the day be that leads to these unholy doings. On days like this day, day, tis hard for young men to bide quiet at home and take their cup of tea with their dead, brought sweet and strong to em by such as knows what the minister table should be. A lot you care, Master Sam, with the poisonous foreign sweetmeats your dad'll have to eat, and, <laughs> and what devil's damn drinks he'll have to drink out there over splots more. It's think Miss Zoily, Zoyland ye be after. Look at its cheeks, masters. Look at its cheeks. Whew. I didn't know Mr. Zoyland had a daughter, Penny, remarked that the rector gently, looking anywhere except in the direction of his son's confusion. I never said she had, master, averred the woman stoutly, glancing at her embarrassed foster child with a defiant glare. Penny's thinking of that fair at, of, uh, at Hornblottom, Father, when I took Mrs. Zoyland on the merry-go-round with me. You were there yourself. You saw us. I'd be ashamed to say such unkind things of a quiet little lady like that, Penny. I ain't said nothing about no quiet lady, protested Mrs. Pitches. My words be to a, a younger master what stands above us among these here daddies. Tatties? Well, Penny, said Mr. Decker with decision, I'm afraid it looks anyhow as if you'd be a lone woman today. Sam, quite right. I did promise the Zoilines to walk over to White Lake River this afternoon, and I did tell Weatherwax that we would come across to lunch. Did Mrs. Drew send for any brandy as I told her to? Brandy, cried Miss Penny Pitches in high dungeon. You'll have plenty of brandy left, you will, if you go giving it round to all the old maids in Selvis Street. Sound a little bit like John Wayne that time, sorry. But, my dear Penny, said Mr. Deck, said Matt Decker, stretching out his long, white-shirted arm across the handles of the wheelbarrow 
and taking the woman caressingly by the shoulder. Miss Drew sent weather wax for that brandy that we might drink it at lunch. We and Mary's new cousin. So I do hope you'll not been crotchety and refused it to him. Refused it? The words came like a bullfrog's croak from the geometrical center of that well-aproned human square that had planted itself before them. Thick wood weather wax be settled in me chair in the pantry at me table this blessed minute. Refused it? Why, he's been tasting thick brandy for the last hour. He said he'd be tasting it so to see it be the same as Miss Drew had from in, in Christmas. If it be the same, he'll take it over, he says, same as he, she told he to. And I do tell her that if not the same, there'll be no need to worry about leaving it in the bottle, for a bottle'll be like the own stomach, master, on Sunday morn. Bottle'll be empty and tinkling. Ugh. Well, you run off now, Penny, and let Sam and me finish this couple of rows. Tell old Weatherwax it is the same. Let Miss Drew have that what she wants, and cork up the bottle. I'll go do the same work this morning if we're going to White Lake. I've got to do some work if we're going to go this morning to White Lake. Never mind about those, Sam. I'll wheel away the rest myself. You go back to the house now with Penny up. Oh, and if you change the water in the aquarium, do find a bowl of some kind to put that minnow in. It's only been up to the top since yesterday afternoon, and I changed the water two days ago. This expression, up on the top, referred to the habit of minnows when sick or dying of remaining with their heads up slanted at the top of the water, breathing heavily. Sam Decker surveyed the retaining form of Penny Pitches. He was of a lankier build than his father, and there was something pathetically animal-like about his shambling limbs. He had a clean-shaven, rather puckered face, with freckles all over it. His nose was long and thin, like the nose of some kind of honey-eating bear, and his small, greenish eyes were surrounded by many wrinkles. His upper lip was long, like his father's, but while Matt Decker had a massive square chin to support this peculiarity, Sam had a weak, retreating chin. Sam's retreating chin was in many ways the most marked portion of his face, for it was creased with all manner of queer coagulations. He had a nervous trick of opening his mouth a little, drawing in his upper jaw, and pulling down the corners of his underlip. The effect of these movements was to compel the contours of his chin to fuse themselves with the contours of his long neck. Had his face been anything but what it was, this trick of contorting his chin would have been much more noticeable. But where everything was so much out of proportion, no particular lapse could become prominent. His greenish eyes almost closed as he stood there in a heavy daze, while his father, anxious to finish the last long piece of weeding, bent over again at his work. Sam Decker was not only for moralizing on the events of his life, he was not one for moralizing on the events of his life, nor for analyzing his motives. He took for granted that it was just one more trick of nature, that his interest in fossils, and birds' eggs, and fishes, should lose its savor month after month as he found himself entoiled in the beauty of Nell Zoyland. He took it for granted that in his weakness he should not dare to mention his entanglement up to his father, that in his weakness he should lie to the old man as to the real meaning of the long solitary excursions he was always making these days, past Birdham and Splotsmoor, across White Lake River to Queen's Sedgemoor. He took it for granted that he should be too unpractical and too cowardly to dream of carrying Nell off or separating her from the formidable William or of doing anything of, at all to clarify the situation. All he could do was to go on constantly seeing her, which intensified rather than resolved the dilemma he was in. He loved his father with a deep passive animal intensity which, with which he loved Nell. It was indeed his love for his father quite as much as his natural timidity that made it absolutely impossible that he, that he should reveal to the older man the real tragedy of the situation. This tragedy was not only did he love Neil Zoylan, but that Neil Nell loved him recklessly, shamelessly, and with constantly urging him cost what it might to both of them to carry her off. It had been the deepest and the most excited astonishment of his life, the fact that a girl as lovely as Nell could love an ugly, lumpish, uninteresting failure such as he felt himself to be. 
Nell, too, who had so original, so surprisingly good-looking a man as Will Zoyland for her mate. William was, it is true, a good deal older than Nell, but what a man he was with his leonine beard and rolling blue eyes, his enormous courage, his immense physical strength. Under the low forehead of Sam Decker, there stirred strange feelings towards this formidable rival, whose power of character was so little to be trifled with. Even Sam's father, no negligent personage himself, showed evident respect for William Zoilin. It was indeed this respect of Matt Decker for the bearded man that had brought about this excursion this afternoon, an excursion which, though he had himself reminded his father of it, filled Sam's heart with a deep uneasiness. Now, as he slowly plodded off to refill the aquarium in their playroom, he cursed Penny Pitches for her uncalled-for outbursts. What had indeed the absurd woman to meddle in his affairs? Never before had she deliberately and willfully betrayed him to his father. As a rule, in any trifling misunderstanding between her two men, she took the side of her master's son against her master. The more he thought about, the less he understood it. Penny, he knew, was anything but puritanical. The indecent jokes that passed between her and old Weatherwax were the standing disgrace of Glastonbury Vicarage. How much does she know? He asked himself as he entered the house. And the idea that some gossiping crony of the old woman had seen his meetings with Nell or on Channel Moor or in the old barn on Golden Godney Marsh began to taunt his brain. Left to remember to finish his wedding, webbing, weeding. Matt Decker sternly put out to his mind the whole matter of Penny's attack upon Sam. Decker's nature was a rich, deep, passionate one, but his religion had assisted him in bringing it under a rare and unusual control. Out of the chief, one of the chief things he had learned to do was to obliterate every sexual suspicion. One of Matt's favorite writers was St. Paul, and he had made a custom of forcing himself not to think evil, a characteristic of that divine agape which, according to St. Paul, held the magic clue to the universe. But there was a power not now shining down upon Mr. Decker that cared nothing for St. Paul. The soul of a great burning sun which illuminated that massive iron-gray bent head had many times ere this been aroused to anger against him. Among the myriads of conscious beings propelling this hemisphere of our planetary orb who refused in that spring solstice to make the sort of grateful gesture towards this great deity which the powers of nature demand of those they favor, this ruddy-faced man in shirt sleeves bending now over the potato bed seemed to that flaming heart the most obdurate and most sacrilegious. Light has Christ protect him, thought, if we can call the titanic motions of superconsciousness and such a power by the name of thought, this great outpour of life heat. As for us, we will not lo let loose his own offspring upon him, and the things he loved most in the world will rouse up against him. And we'll stop there today. Well, that's great. We got a nice break from uh, John Crow, which is fantastic. Uh, it's back to being kind of boring, which is good. And I apologize. There's some, uh, you know, stereotypical dialecty crone character that I gotta do. But ho hopefully, she won't be in there that much, so I don't have to embarrass myself with a bad accent. Although that can kind of be fun sometimes too. And oh yeah, so next by next time I should look up what the title means Hick Jesse or or what have you well until then cheers